and welcome to the Medicine Matters Rheumatology Podcast. I'm Claire Barnard. In this series of podcasts, we are exploring the use of rheumatology drugs for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. For this episode, we are talking to Dr. Al Kim about hydroxychloroquine. Al is a rheumatologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri in the USA. So the the past few months have seen lots of research studies on hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. Al, could you tell me why there's been so much interest in this drug in particular? So uh, obviously the uh, the pandemic induced by SARS-CoV-2, you know, COVID-19 has um, really been a, you know, a dramatic um, negative influence on financial and social situations glo- world, you know, globally. So there was a very um, kind of rapid response to try to identify you know, drugs or methods to be able to attenuate its effect. So I think one of the things that occurred very early on was uh, identification of older data of anti-malarial such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine against SARS-CoV-1. And then uh, newer data earlier this year in vitro demonstrated some effect of hydroxychloroquine on SARS-CoV-2. The issue though with some of this data is um, based on how how well it inhibited viral replication in vitro and how these definitions were applied. Uh, The initial data uh, demonstrated that an EC50 or the effective concentration to inhibit 50% of viral replication was somewhere around uh, one micromolar. But the reality is, is that you really want to be able to block it 90% or even 100%, which brought up the numbers to about 10 to 20 micromolar. When you translate those numbers into blood concentrations of hydroxychloroquine, these exceeded what we typically use hydroxychloroquine uh, in lupus patients, rheumatoid arthritis patients, Sjogren's syndrome patients, which is around 600 to 1400 nanograms. So instead of those concentrations, the concentrations needed to inhibit probably, possibly in vivo, required concentrations of about three to seven nano, um, micrograms per mil. So uh, you know there's a discordance in terms of what the in vitro data suggested would be effective versus what we rea- in, uh, what we see in terms of concentrations in reality. Uh, but from this data, then uh, it, uh, emerged narratives about the potential effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine as a uh, either prophylactic or therapeutic against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, what do the data from the clinical studies tell us about hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19? So, it really was divided into two kind of segments. The first initial segment. Um, were low quality studies suggesting a plausibility that it could be effective against SARS-CoV-2. So uh, much of the early data came from uh, Didier Raoult's uh, group in Marseille, France. And really it was a, uh, he called it a clinical trial, is really more of a, you know, a case series where he um, uh, reported data showing that uh, hydroxychloroquine, particularly in combination with azithromycin, um, was able to reduce, uh, eliminate the virus as detected in the, uh, by a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, a major issue, there were several major issues with this report though, and the biggest one was that um, the, there were patients that had been excluded from analysis that were in the treatment arm um, who either died or were transferred to the ICU. Um, and the reason why they were excluded is because they were unable to get the day six nasopharyngeal swab as defined by its primary outcome. So uh, they were essentially lost to follow up. But as a result, you know, these they they were not able to report these data as uh, necessarily negative. Um, and so it kind of art, it artificially increased the um, the true effectiveness of of hydroxychloroquine as a um, as a therapeutic. Better studies that had been uh, more thoroughly vetted and were much larger started to become reported um, essentially in like the late spring, early summer. The tide really turned though when um, the Boulware study for, in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out in early uh, June uh, definitively showed in our eyes that uh, hydroxychloroquine was not effective as a therapeutic in SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, uh, infections. And so from this, uh, there were additional data that had come out uh, 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 revealing very similar uh, findings. Uh, One report that was, uh, that showed that potential benefit was a report from Henry Ford's uh, hospital. Uh, But one of the confounders, which was the use of glucocorticoids 
which had been earlier potentially uh, shown to be effective, this was not controlled for. So this was uh, a potential explanation why the hydroxychloroquine group uh, became uh, where you had better outcomes than those did not get hydroxychloroquine. So even though the pendulum early on demonstrated that there's a potential benefit, and certainly in vitro, there was inhibition of viral replication. The problem was that the concentrations required may not be physiologic. And then the early clinical reports that demonstrated efficacy were of such low quality, it was virtually impossible to uh, generate proper interpretation. And this, but the problem was that lag in between those early reports and then the properly controlled report studies that were reported later in the spring and summer. And that gap really caused uh, substantial problems for our patients with rheumatic diseases. So how about hydroxychloroquine for the prevention of COVID-19? Are there any data about that? Yes. So again, I, this was kind of divided into uh, two different uh, time periods, very similar. Um, early on, um, there, were, there were no studies looking at hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic, and much of the um, support for hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic was um, extrapolated from the treatment data. Uh, but early reports from the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance clearly showed that patients who are with systemic lupus erythritosis who take hydroxychloroquine were getting COVID-19 at similar rates as other uh, rheumatic diseases, um, which you know, suggested that, the, that hydroxychloroquine was not effective as a prophylactic. It did not definitively show that, uh, but it, it strongly suggested that. Uh, but there were additional studies uh, later on um, that uh, looked at uh, prophylaxis that uh, pretty much that showed that the its use as a prophylactic was um, probably not a very effective. I think the biggest problem that we see with those type of studies is the infection rate at the population level for COVID nineteen still remains relatively low. So, and again, the Boer study um, kind of you know was really the first to be able to show this as a post-exposure prophylactic. I mean, again, this study was interesting because it, it took, um, you know, essentially healthcare workers, you know, who were in high-risk situations and, 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 you know, half of them got hydroxychloroquine. So again, this was probably the best way to be able to show something like this. Uh, but again, the, the sum of the data was, uh, again, negative for the support of using hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic. You touched on um, negative impact for rheumatology practice. Could you outline how the investigation of hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19 has impacted a rheumatologist and their patients? Yeah, so again, the narrative was, it's, it's pretty um, remarkable how fast this narrative spreads, particularly through social media. Um, you know, when the in vitro data was published, there were uh, Didi Raoud's group and you know, his colleagues essentially put a YouTube video demonstrating, you know, you know, arguing for its effect. But simultaneously, there was an effort in um, center essentially in Silicon Valley in the United States where discussions about hydroxychloroquine as an effective treatment for COVID-19 were being discussed. And then obviously there were uh, several world leaders, including the one for you know, the United States who claimed it, um, you know, grossly overclaimed its, its success as a treatment. So the main issue that we run into with hydroxychloroquine is that the supply chain is quite uh, slow, largely because it's really used in diseases that are uncommon. Rheumatoid arthritis is about 1% of the world population. Lupus is about 0.1% of the world population. So now if you're going to be increasing its interest uh, where uh, potentially you know, 30, 50, 70% of the population now wants to have access to it, you can immediately see the problems in terms of supply. So with the enthusiasm around hydroxychloroquine, you ended up having a substantial um, increase in prescriptions, which was confirmed by several reports. There were efforts to stockpile hydroxychloroquine, drug uh, shortages ensued. And the main risk was really best quantified in, in lupus patients because the hydroxychloroquine is the only drug to demonstrate a survival benefit in lupus. And on top of that, uh, there is good data demonstrating that um, if you discontinue hydroxychloroquine, people can flare so pretty substantially and they can flare as soon as two weeks. And the risk there is that the healthcare system was already overloaded 
Many lupus flares require hospitalization, so it adds additional stress into the healthcare system in a way that you know, we were unable to you know, uh, anticipate. So you know, a, a critical drug for lupus patients, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome patients, now was unable to be obtained by these patients, and then their disease, their disease um, then flared and, and it put uh, these patients at unnecessary risk. This put pressure on rheumatologists to be able to find and source other ways to be able to get hydroxychloroquine for our patients, but this was really difficult given the fact that um, the stockpiling occurred both at, uh, at the individual level, but also at the institutional level. We're talking hospitals, pharmacies, and even governments. So is, is this still a problem now? More studies have come out to show that hydroxychloroquine doesn't prevent COVID-19 and isn't effective as a treatment, or um, are these problems still ongoing? So fortunately, the problems have largely disappeared. There are some relic of rules that have um, uh, lingered on, and particularly from a prescription point of view. So there are certain um, prescription plans that are still only giving hydroxychloroquine at two week intervals. You know, in the, you know, we typically give drugs either in the 30 or 90 day interval, but and with you know with refills, but the and the two week one is really to make sure that the they that the pharmacies have the right supply and that they're giving it to the right people. But unfortunately, this continues to add to kind of the burden and decreased quality of life of patients uh, who require hydroxychloroquine for their disease. So um, while the impact is not nearly as severe as it was, say in May or late April. There's a small fraction of patients that still are experiencing issues um, where their, you know, the quality of life is still impacted. So, what advice um, would you say rheumatologists should give to their patients if a patient came to them with concerns about accessing their drugs? To me, I think the burden really um, falls on to the rheumatologist. Unfortunately, um, we have taken the responsibility to identify pharmacies that have stock that do not have stock. Try to help these pharmacies that don't have stock inquire about you know where their supply chain is coming from, whether or not it could be sourced elsewhere. Um, but the other thing too is to help the patient find pharmacies to be able to get uh, a reliable stock of hydroxychloroquine. In terms of uh, limitations of prescriptions, that's much more challenging. Obviously, in the U.S., for example, you know once you're on one insurance, it's very difficult to switch. Um, uh, there's really kind of only one you know, window in the U.S. In, in, um, in November if you want to take advantage of the Affordable Care Act. And so um, outside that window uh, for many of our patients, it is difficult to switch insurances. And so as a result, uh, we try to help facilitate their you know, renewal issues or to ensure to talk to their insurance companies' rationales why the uh, use of hydroxychloroquine for a particular patient with autoimmune disease is required. Again, I think, unfortunately, the burden does fall onto the rheumatologist. And so it has increased our workload, but I think and our duty to our patients requires us to have to respond in this way. We've talked so far about the data on hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19 in people uh, without rheumatic diseases, but how about people with lupus or with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, who are taking hydroxychloroquine regularly for their rheumatic disease. Are there any data about um, their risk for COVID-19 or uh, any different outcomes according to whether they're taking hydroxychloroquine or not? Yeah, so that's actually, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, again, the data from um, the uh, COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance, along with other data from Boston, uh, from like Jeff Sparks and Zach Wallace, among others, have shown that patients with rheumatic diseases appear to have an increased risk of having more severe complications of COVID-19. There's no real clear data showing that rheumatic disease patients are at increased risk of getting COVID-19. I think all of that is really just based off of exposure, uh, just like anyone else. But once um, autoimmune patients um, contract COVID-19, there is a slightly incre higher increased risk of having more severe disease. Now, is this due to the disease itself or is it due to medications? These uh, data uh, continue to emerge, but it appears that at least with hydroxychloroquine, there is no substantial difference in terms of severity outcomes. It does not help prevent severity, uh, but it also um, it doesn't appear to prov um, to increase severity either. Um, there are other autoimmune drugs where uh, there may be um, some issues with this. I would say rituximab and sulfazalazine, along with uh, glucocorticoids, appear to have increased risk of severity. 
but uh, um, hydroxychloroquine in and of itself appears in rheumatic disease patients to have a null effect on, on, on severe outcomes uh, related to COVID-19. So is, is this the end of the road for hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19, or do you think that there's more research needed in any particular area? Well, I thought that the hydroxychloroquine story was, died essentially this summer. Um, there are constant upwellings of various themes due to the politicalization of numerous topics within COVID-19, including hydroxychloroquine. This is something that came up in late November as a topic of interest within the U.S. government, uh, despite the fact that we really feel like that this story uh, had um, seen its last days over the summer. So again, um, I think the impact of this, it continues to be minimized largely because I think uh, the, the appropriate narrative of hydroxychloroquine as a ineffective treatment for COVID-19 has persisted. But again, there's still pockets where this is something that people continue to uh, push forward. And again, we just have to um, respond uh, swiftly with, with proper information and interpretation as opposed to misinterpretation. Thank you very much to Al and thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by Medwine News for Medicine Matters Rheumatology. Please subscribe for more podcasts on repurposing rheumatology drugs for COVID-19. Medicine Matters Rheumatology will also be covering the latest research and guidance on managing COVID-19 in patients with rheumatic diseases. Keep an eye on rheumatology.medicinematters.com for updates.